Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present about another episode of Herald Tribune World Youth Forum from 1954, this episode discussion about the family in America. Presenter of the discussion is Mrs. Helen Height Waller. Participated following students. Vangala J. Ram from India. Ms. Kamiko Fujitsuchiya from Japan. Mr. Roger Rajluni from Jordan. Ms. Caroline White from United States. our second annual series of high school forum discussion programs on the world we want. The participants in the discussion will be the 32 students, high school students from 32 countries who are in the United States now as forum delegates. Each of these students was chosen in nationwide competitions sponsored in their own countries last year by the Ministry of Education. The students came here by Transworld Airlines Pan American World Airways and Panagra. For nearly all of them, it's their first travel abroad, and it's their first trip in airplanes for most. As you can see by the map, the four countries, the 32 countries represented this year, encircle a globe and cover, or touch at least, all five continents. There are four new countries added to the forum list this year. In Africa, there's the Gold Coast and the Union of South Africa. From the Middle East, there's Transjordan. And from the Far East, for the first time, we have a delegate from the Ryukyu Islands, where Okinawa is. This year, in one country, 17,000 students participated in the forum competition. That was India. But now, let me introduce you. Uh, right here on my left, from India, is Vangala Ram. Thank Ram, uh, tell us something about yourself, will you? Um, I'm 18 now. I come from, the, from, come from Lucknow, and I'm a student, a junior in college, in the Lucknow University. And um, uh, my main interest is uh, in speaking and writing, and uh, I have been a, a student, and uh, I have had the displeasure of being one of those who has almost always stood first in class. I say this pleasure, not out of a made, it, made up modesty, you know, but uh, because I think that a student who has stood first has all sorts of associations with him. One looks upon him as a bookworm, as uh, one whose first and last interest in life is books, and is so on. Is that true? Yes, I feel that is true. I have often been accused of it. But I'm also interested in sports. I have been the cricket captain of my school, and uh, I'm a debater. I'm very fond of debating. Not because I'm fond of discussion, <laughs> but uh, uh, I like to disagree sometimes. And what about your family? Can you tell us anything about uh, them? My father was born in a peasant family, but uh, he came to America on his own. He was an enterprising man, and he studied in the Harvard University for eight years. And uh, it is due to that fact that I'm so interested in America. I think I'm really fortunate in being able to come to America, because I think that the proper age when one should go abroad is just when one is old enough to form conviction, and just uh, just before actually one has begun to form conviction. And you'd and say 18 is that yeah, age? 18 is that age, yes. yes now right. next here is Kimiko Fuji from Japan. Kimiko lives in Hiroshima. Kimiko, tell us something about you, will you? I'm 18 today. Today? <laughs> oh, many happy returns, Kimiko. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I'm really happy I could come in winter. How beautiful the trees with light snow on top. I really didn't expect such a beautiful America. You know, we oh. always think of Japanese paintings of having trees and mountains with <laughs> snow on top. Maybe that's <laughs> why you liked it so much. Uh, Kimiko, were you in Hiroshima when the bomb dropped? I was just in country. And uh, how far from Hiroshima? 
It, it's uh, Hiroshima, uh, isn't it, or Hiroshima? Hiroshima. Uh, one hour by automobile. Do you remember anything about it? Well, uh, it was so fine day, and uh, on that day I saw a beautiful cloud of a uh, summer run away so far, and then a uh, uh, mushroom of clouds of atomic bomb fell down. It was just terrible. <laughs> Was any of your family in the city? You say you were yes, outside uh, it. Uh, my sister's face was fine, but uh, she's all right now. She is all right yes. now. We're working. And uh, all the people yeah. in Hiroshima are very friendly towards American people because uh, American people taught us democracy. So they are trying very hard to know democracy. And I, uh, before I came here, I received many letters from unknown people and in all of them they said uh, they want me to run democracy in the country where Dinka was born. Well, we're glad to hear that from you, Kimiko. Wish you'd stand up and turn around so we can see your costume, would you, for us? Will you turn around so we can see the big bow in the back? Before you sit down, I want you to do one more thing for me. The day you arrived, you remember you gave me this fan? I loved having it, but I've been trying in vain to move it the way you do it. Show us how you do that again, will you? Thank you, Kamiko. I'm afraid I'll never learn. Our, our third guest from overseas is Raja Ajluni from Jordan. Uh, now we need to know something about you, Raja. Uh, sure. Uh, I come from Jordan, which is one of the Middle East countries, and uh, I was born 17 years ago in a town about 10 miles away from Jerusalem, the holy city. I grew up in a Quaker home, being the youngest in my family, and uh, I'm now in my 11th year of education. I intend, of course, to to join the college next year. But I don't know what I'm going to study. Do you want to go over to the map of the Middle East, Raja, and show us where your home is in Jordan? You might, since it's such a new country, show us the outline, too, with your finger, will you? Before 1948, we had two separate states, namely Transjordan and Palestine. But after the hostilities between the Arabs and the Jews, Palestine was divided into two parts, one of which is called Israel now. The other part of it was unified and annexed to Transjordan proper. Now, both Transjordan and Palestine originate what is called Jordan now. And it's this screen. All that that you're outlining yeah. now is Jordan. My hometown is right here, very near to the borders to Israel. It's only about 50 miles away from the Mediterranean coast. Anybody from your hometown ever come to the United States before, Raja? Yes, uh, in fact, three of my brothers are now in America studying in universities. And one of my sisters is also married there. Any other people from your town come well, to America? Well, my hometown has 17,000 inhabitants. And strangely enough, 3,000 3, of these are now in America as Ooh, students yeah. and as immigrants. This is, of course, not typical of the other towns in Jordan, but it's an individual case. It's a very interesting <laughs> fact. Now, the final guest is our American student representative. Uh, she is Caroline White from Leonia, New Jersey. Now, a bit about you, Carolyn. Well, I seem to be the baby of the group. I'm only 16, but I'm a senior in high school in Leonia, and I plan to go to college next year, somewhere in the east. Uh, my father is dean of the Columbia University School of Library Science. And I had the privilege two weeks ago of having with me for two weeks the guests from uh, Thailand, or Siam. I should have said a moment ago that the reason these students <coughs> can come here is because of the wonderful hospitality and friendliness of American families who oh, yeah. take them in as their own children. And uh, Caroline has had the delegate from Thailand. Well, now do you want to talk about some of the differences, not that separate us, but differences of background and training and culture that have made being together for the month that we've been together so very interesting. How do we start? 
First, I'd like to ask, uh, what were your impressions of Americans before you came here? So, uh, when you think of uh, America from India, you think of a young country which during the last few years has uh, been able to achieve a remarkable progress in the technological sphere. And you think of a country which has very high standards of living and of a people who have come to acquire world leadership and have of late also begun to realize their responsibility as a world leader. And uh, <clears throat> you therefore think of a people who have a desire to help as exemplified in some of the programs like the point four. And uh, you also think that uh, in the hierarchy of values in this country, the material values preponderate over the more spiritual values. I don't know how far you'll agree, but that is what is generally believed. Well, now it's your turn, Carolyn. What's been your stereotype of a Hindu, for example? Well, uh, I have always thought of the Indians, along with Japanese and other Asiatics, as a more mature area of the world. They've had civilization for so long that when we deal with them, it seems as if we're like an adolescent trying to deal with a mature person. <laughs> Thank you for complimenting us, but uh, I don't think this is what is generally believed here. Because what, from what I've seen of students here, they seem to think that uh, India is a country where you have a number of people and where, uh, where they don't have enough to eat and where cows roam about on the streets and people sleep on beds of nails. This is what it is. <laughs> and not that we are matured people dealing with adolescents. <laughs> Are you something to add to that, Roger? Well, uh, I have something to add about uh, the, uh, the characteristic of an American. And uh, in fact, I agree with every point that Ram has pointed out, but I would like to emphasize the idea that the American people are really practical people compared with the Asiatic people. The brain here, brain is the main guide for a man, while in our country and in most the Asiatic countries, men are, and women especially are led by their emotions. <laughs> That's it. And uh, did you have any stereotype of an Arab? For example? Um, well, there's always a picture we have uh, when people say Arabs, they put people on uh, camels running over deserts and living in tents and having white flowing robes. And then we also think of them connected with uh, 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 crusades in that part of our history. Hardly applies to our friend Raja, does it? Well, I'm afraid the, the pictures you have seen do not seem to give you a good idea no, about the that. country. Because, in fact, uh, <coughs> only 20% of Jordan, for instance, population are living in desert and as nomads, while the other 80% are living in cities and villages. Well, it's a high romanticized 20%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rajat, let me ask you this. Uh, how do you think that this land of ours, its geography and history, has made Americans what they are? Well, as for the history of the country, as you know, it's a very new country and it's a combination of races and nationalities but, and uh, the fact that uh, the people here do not have an old tradition of their own and or custom has uh, been an asset for them because i believe in a society where people are not troubled by old traditions and customs a progress can have a much more fertile field than in countries where old history and traditions have still their control over people. No, but that is technological progress and not necessarily social progress or um, a spiritual progress. Well, see, because uh, that's what I meant by progress, exactly. Mm. Have you and anything to add to that, Ron? Well, I do believe that because I have a theory that uh, the youngest nation is the fastest. Just as a child picks up things much more easily and much more quickly and is far more impressionable to new things and also has a spirit of innovation, a young nation also has that. And a young nation would go in for new things and therefore would have a faster rate of progress. The older the country, the slower the progress. I think this should be a generalization which holds true. Uh, let me ask you one other question along the same line, since we're comparing notes. If you had, if you could give one gift to the American people that your people have, what would you like it to be? Composure. Composure. Yes. Well, now tell us more, Kimiko. Uh, I've been tea parties here very often. And their people uh, talk and laugh, but the Japanese tea party, which we call tea ceremony, is different from yours uh, in c purpose. It said that tea ceremony teaches us composure, and tea ceremony is held very in very quiet place. Anything else? What? Uh, uh, and. Uh, 
Japanese uh, girls like me uh, learn tea ceremony uh, for two or three years. A uh, very tea ceremony. Yes. How do you learn it? Well, uh, you there's a, a regular way to serve tea. But who teaches you? Your mother or? Uh, yes, sometimes my mother. But uh, uh, there are many teachers in Japan who teach us uh, tea ceremony. And what about uh, flower arrangements? Do you flower think we could use some of that uh, American flower arrangements? Well, it's flower arrangements. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Japanese uh, girls also learn flower arrangement as well as tea ceremony. And I'm not used learning, but uh, my mother takes me very often to exhibition to appraise those beautifully arranged flowers. But in most cases, uh, those flower arrangements are very, very simple, not like that. But how long would it say it will take you when you start studying flower arrangement to what? know flower arrangement? Well, uh, one year is enough. A year is yes. enough? And uh, uh, especially the flower arrangement for New Year's Day, so beautiful. Uh, it has only two or three pine trees of just beautiful bark. I'm going to get you out to my house before <laughs> you do. Uh, Roger, how about may you? May I add another gift? Yes. Uh, well, let's begin this way. To give somebody a gift does not necessarily mean that he lacks what you gave him. But uh, what I'm going to speak about now is not lacking in America entirely, but it is needed. Now, the first question which faces a man is how to live. And in a society like in America, especially in the highly industrialized part of it, it uh, necessitates a man to be too much practical and materialistic in order to live. And undoubtedly, money can provide and is, is capable of providing a person a lot of happiness. But this happiness is mortal. So I think we should be ambitious to seek for an immortal sort of happiness. And we can get this by being more interested in the spiritual side of life. After all, we should not forget that we are living in a mysterious world and we are still far from understanding many of the secrets, major secrets of life. But let me ask you this. I'm sorry, Ram, go ahead. I think that this is because uh, in America what you strive for is efficiency. And, uh, and you sometimes mistake that you come to happiness through efficiency. And it sometimes happens that you have efficiency but you don't have happiness. And uh, it is this fact which, uh, which needs to be emphasized. I mean, the spiritual basis for life is uh, not as much there as it should be. Uh, let me go back to Raja's point on being practical. Is there any way in which you've seen us be practical, that you, uh, any way in which you'd rather we'd be more impractical? And give us an example, please. Well, I would rather give uh, an insignificant one. And this is it. For instance, I have noticed that a woman here, a mother, treats her son as a guest, as an entirely independent person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you can notice that mostly when she gives him a, his allowance, for instance. Well, it would have been better if the mother treats her son as a real part of her. And when she gives him an allowance, she could bring home to him the idea that, after all, he does not need this allowance, and his parents are responsible to support him all his life and they give him this allowance only not they have to but because they love him and they give him this allowance and that money is not important for him as he is. Uh, how about a gift from India? Um, I think that this um, spiritual basis to your to our civilization is something that you can take to advantage. The average American is not as philosophically inclined as he ought to be and I think that a co combination of philosophy and technology would be ideal. We, on the other hand, are the other extreme. We, we are too unreal, too ideal, and too far removed from the immediate, and too much in the distant. Mm -hmm. And you are too much in the present, and not enough in the distant. You are in the finite, and not in the infinite. I think... Uh, <laughs> uh, may, yes? may, may I say something? Well, I should like to criticize Ram in something about this philosophically inclined American. In fact, uh, in our last two weeks where we spent in New Jersey, remember, in Inglewood, yes, yes. our host students were themselves philosophers. 
Oh, you exception proves the rule. I think that's just the case <laughs> of exception proves <laughs> the rule. <laughs> and, uh, well, can, excuse me, can we turn the question around? Is there any one gift that you would like your people to get from America? Oh, we can get a lot of gifts. But uh, I think the most appreciable one and practical one is this spirit of cooperation among people and working together. Your point, uh, incidentally, Mrs. Waller, about one month back in Cobra House, you remember I asked mm. you that, uh, I said that um, I, I came to America with the impression that in American society, since it was a free economy and a private enterprise, it was competition which is the basic fabric of American democracy. But after coming here, I began to notice that it was more cooperation than competition. I would like to know whether it is cooperation or competition or if it is a mixture of both really. Well, I remember when you asked me the question, Ram, we were all very interested in it. I asked you if you wouldn't uh, uh, tell me in a month's time what you thought. So you've been here a month or six weeks now. What do you think? Oh, I have begun to feel that uh, cooperation and competition are not necessarily mutually exclusive and that uh, one is implicit in the other. And you can't have really competition without cooperation. But I'll say this, that more fundamentally, in the more fundamental cases, you cooperate. And in the more ultimate cases, it is a case of competition. Well, For example, in the economic field. Let Carolyn get in well, here. Can I say something <coughs> here? We're a country that was made up of uh, various countries. I mean, we're all a bunch of mongrels, perhaps, or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're made up of, we're the melting pot, as has often been said. And we'd have to cooperate because it's either be an awful lot of small factions and small states are we all have to cooperate, and we learn to cooperate. And then for the competition, every man has a chance here. When he came over, these were people who were seeking something spiritual when they came over. And then they, uh, they can go up, they can come over and go straight to the top, depending on what they have in themselves. There's no caste and class system to hold them down. And uh, so there they have competition. But there's, I think cooperation is the key to American way of life. I would put that um, over the competition. I think that you are mixing up between freedom of opportunity and, um, and competition. Competition does not mean freedom of opportunity, really. It implies freedom of opportunity, but it can't be taken to be synonymous with it, really. Uh, yes, Roger. May I answer the discussion? Uh, I should emphasize, really, that our comprehension as, was, as Easterners of the, the two words, uh, cooperation and competition, is not uh, identical to that of the American people. Oh, explain simply, that. simply because we are emotional people. We, we see, we, for instance, when when you find a friend of yours competing with you, your um, your emotions lead you to the to the attitude that he's trying to be aggressive. But in America, I, as I've noticed, uh, competition is merely a a part of the, of cooperation. Without competition, you cannot have cooperation here. Is there anything that makes you think that we are better cooperators than uh, people in other parts of the world? Yeah. What, for example? Well, in the family life, for instance. And you've been in small communities, too? Yeah. I assume it's there are not. examples there? Yes, in the local communities you do cooperate. As I said, that in the more local cases, in the more smaller cases you cooperate. But in the more ultimate cases, it is a case of competition. Uh, um, what are you thinking now about the American family, the oh, yes. situation which disturbed you so much when you yes. came? I think this is one of the topics that has been uh, engaging my attention since I've been here. Uh, I'm getting the impression that um, the, the family as, as a social institution is declining in its importance. I won't say it has disappeared. It is disappearing, mind you. I mean, mm -hmm. And um, I'm only mentioning this as with great emphasis because I think that it is time that you began to consider it with some seriousness and with uh, something that may cause you concern. Because uh, uh, I think that a state, that, uh, a state may come when if the family disappears altogether, you will have communism. I mean, the very thing that uh, should be avoided. Well, you don't seriously uh, think that that state is coming in America soon, do you? No, but it is a state which must be taken at least uh, theoretically into consideration. What can we do about it? I mean, what can we do about changing the family so that it does well, not, as you say, disappear? Well, what would you recommend? Yeah? Well, I would, I would like to strengthen his point by saying that uh, during my stay here, I've never heard anybody saying or mentioning of uncle, of uncle of his, unless he says Uncle Sam was. <laughs> and uh, this is the more superficial part of it, of course, but I think the, f the family here is more efficient than it Yes, is. I do want to say this, that you are, the family is declining in importance, but you are gaining in efficiency. But then uh, here again you have to decide that is efficiency your ultimate objective? I mean, you find every function which the family used to perform is now being taken up by specialized institutions. For example, when the child got sick, 
he was treated by his mother instead of being sent to a hospital. Now he's sent to a hospital, but he's better looked after there. Your clothes are washed at home instead of being sent to a laundry. But, but ma'am, let me ask you this. What would you say is the better basis for a democratic society? Your family system, your tribal system that is the basis of your family system, your family system in Japan, or our small families where we live in communities that all cooperate? Well, I think in a democratic state like America, uh, a person should not be as much concerned about his own family as he is in the East. He should be more concerned about the nation as a whole. No, I think that, uh, <laughs> that democracy implies difference of opinion. And difference of opinion can only come when each family operates as a separate unit and retaining its identity. If you have a, a common pool of ideas, you begin to think in a rut and there is more of standardization, which I think is opposed to democracy. You agree? And, well, not exactly. Well, you can, you can, you can go too far with, uh, with that, though, too. You get a fierce family pride that uh, sort of uh, closes your eyes to other things. And I think uh, families will always remain the core that is people are born and they have a natural devotion to their family and I don't think that he sees a trend but I don't think it's going to go all the way and d d dissolve the family I think that there will always be a family tie and perhaps we get out from it but perhaps when you you've been here you've seen how close families parents and daughters and everything really are they're close and they love each other very much no Let I don't me add one point here is it possible that the cooperation you've seen in communities in a sense replaces the feeling of unity that you get in your big family groups in India and your... Yes, it does. Uh, but they're not the same category. I think uh, there are two different categories of things in Delhi. I mean, uh, the cooperation of, as a, uh, in a family as a unit implies kinship, whereas cooperation uh, on another level it implies uh, the cooperation of the community, which is a different level of cooperation, and you can't put them all on the same level. Ram, our time's been getting away from us. <laughs> I wonder if you'd be good enough to tie these ideas together for us, will you? Well, uh, you started off by saying that uh, we all have differences and that we all come from different backgrounds and therefore we should uh, consider these differences. I think that uh, uh, nothing can be more useful than having differences because uh, uh, once, you have, once you are centered in yourself and you are don't take into consideration a different situation, you just lead to stagnation and decay. But if you take into consideration a different situation, you can always learn from it. Now take an instance, your country is a young country but it has been able to achieve a remarkable progress. And this progress, uh, older countries shouldn't shun off as something which a uh, young country has done. We as an old country and many of the Asian countries have a lot to learn from you. We have so much to learn from you in your modern methods in industrialization and in methods of farming in every single thing. But on the other hand, you have a lot to learn from us. Uh, during our history of 4,000 years, as opposed to your history of 250 years, we have through a process of trial and error, evolved a certain system and this Historical experience cannot be just thrown off. We're see? going to be talking about that again next week when we talk about religion. Since every one of the world's great religions is represented in our forum group. Until then, this is Helen Hyatt Waller.